Is that a question? Good evening. My name is Kobe Little, and I'm we one of those that. students that um, is advocating some addressment of the curriculum at the school. And the point is not that there are some righteous cultures that aren't being discussed. The point is that there are cultures and histories that aren't being discussed. I'm sorry. I, you said you're advocating what? Some examination of the curriculum at this school um, in terms of the inclusion of um, other areas of study. And never was the point that there was a righteous group and that Western culture was not righteous, but that there was some need for discussion of it. I think that one of the problems with this discussion here is that there has really only been half the panel dealing with reality. Um, some reality is that legislation has been passed uh, ending segregation, but if you look at Baltimore, it's still very segregated. If you look at New York schools, they're very segregated. If you look at the housing thing in Texas, it's very segregated. Uh, you said there's change in white attitudes. There's some change, but how many white people here would have a black dentist? How many white people here would vote for a black person over a white person. These are all studies that have been done. You can look at Newsweek or anywhere else you want to look, and they're there. Nobody's dealing with the fundamental. I ask you to get to a question okay. or let the panelists comment on your the question. Is, the question is that I want people to deal with is that we've liked to quote Martin Luther King and say that we had the Civil Rights Movement. And that's the problem. We did have the Civil Rights Movement. But why aren't you all dealing with the fundamental questions that Martin Luther King posed? And those are two points. Number one, he said that for any real progress to be accomplished, White America must realize that there must be a restructuring of American society, one. And two, he said that America wrote African Americans or black people in this country a check, and that check retur returned marked insufficient funds. Okay, that's criminal in itself that there... Th that, okay, let, let the okay, well, address the question then, The question is, is that you're not dealing with the in economic inequalities, and there's no discussion of reparations for black people, and until you deal with these issues, then there really can be no fundamental changes. Thank you. But let's, um, let's discuss these realities. Now, when W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in the early part of the century, the equation of black and poor was a virtually complete one. In other words, it would be accurate to say that virtually all blacks in this country were very poor. And affirmative action, I think, was implemented because people realized there are serious problems that are both racial and class-oriented, and these need to be dealt with. The fact is today, the black community, as Linda Chavez said, is segmented. You have a substantial black middle class, and you have some people who are in the upper middle class or the affluent. We now have to reappraise affirmative action in the light of that fact. Why is it fair to give the son or daughter of Jesse Jackson, who went to private schools in the Washington, D.C. area, a preference to get into Johns Hopkins over the son or daughter of an Appalachian coal miner, the son of a Hispanic doctor, a black engineer? These are middle class people. They go to the same schools with middle class white kids. Very often, there is no reason in a society of scarce resources to apply affirmative action in this way. Now, you, you referred earlier to the question of the ghetto. And whenever we, look, whenever we see oppression, we have to ask, whom does it benefit? Whom does it benefit? Why do we have slavery in this country? Because it benefited people. There was work to do, and there were people who gained from it. Who does the ghetto benefit? Think about it. Does the ghetto benefit whites? How? Crime? Uh, dangers? Ex spending? No. The ghetto, the existence, the persistence of the ghetto benefits an activist class of researchers, professors, social workers. A <laughs> if, if racism were to be abolished overnight, many of these people would be out of a job. That's about one minute. Isn't it? <laughs> Is racism dead in America? Because if, if racism is dead, then what you're saying is right. We don't need affirmative action. We don't need all these other preferential, as you say, uh, different things like that. But if you can honestly say and say to this audience and say to the rest of the audience watching on C-SPAN that racism is dead, then I think you'd probably be laughed out of uh, this auditorium here. Now, this is, wait, this, is, this is not to attack you or anything like that, but I'm just... I'm just, I would just want to know if you think or believe that racism is dead. I'll, because, answer, thank you. I'll you. answer your question, but so, may I pose a quick one to you? Yes. Is anti-Semitism dead in America? No, it's not. And do, should Brown have preferential programs for Jews? Uh, I wouldn't be against it. You think, you think that Brown University should have preferential programs to let Jews, to increase the number of Jews in the student body? I said I wouldn't be against it. Brown is a university that wants to be more culturally diverse. Let me ask you this. Do people in this society have a prejudice against people who are hugely overweight? Yes, they do. And, they and do, do you think Brown University should have a preferential program to let such Excuse people me. in? Stay with it. Stay with it. 
stay with it. St sorry, please stay with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm afraid I have answered it all too well. You no racism no, is sorry, not sorry, that. Sorry, Mr. D'Souza, please, please reply if you'd like. You have not answered my question. I'm going to. Look, like, you, you were talking about, sorry, we, excuse Look. me, excuse me. Let's just sort of stop for a moment. If you'd like to ask a question now, yes. your last question, please right. do so. This is it. You're at the Olympic Games, right? And you're saying how the, it's all equal. Well, in America, and I hate to say it, but the white man has a 50-yard head start. And affirmative action makes that, that playing field just a little bit, little bit leveler. And if you're saying that racism is dead in America, then you're wrong. And I'm I just not. want you to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I might question. also respond. I think those of us who support affirmative action must take care to thoughtfully respond to the question posed by Mr. D'Souza about anti-Semitism. Yeah. His answer suggests that if you support affirmative action, you must therefore abandon all notions of merit and support all forms of preference. That is not true. Affirmative action is not an all or nothing system. I am no more in favor of letting unqualified individuals into this university than Mr. D'Souza is. I am merely saying that each and every one of us has qualifications that don't show up in grades and test scores. And we are more than merely numbers. Thank you. Mr. D'Souza? That is the difference. Thank you. Mr. D'Souza? Wu, Professor Wu's whole argument comes down to this. We have preferences for in-state residents. We have preferences for alumni kids. We have preferences for athletes. What's wrong with preferences based upon race? Earlier he said, these preferences do not confer stigma. Well, I know I went to Dartmouth and we had what was called the athlete's table at which I saw 350 pound guys eating 12 eggs for breakfast. And I assure you there was the stereotype of the dumb jock. So preference in a non-racial context does confer stigma. Here's another point. I'm against alumni preferences, and I would ask Professor Wu that if he wants to be consistent in defending merit, why don't we agree to have a coalition that would abolish alumni preferences and racial preferences both? But here's my point. He is defending these forms of nepotism, alumni preferences, in-state residences. He's not against them. What he's saying is that you've got all these guys feeding at the public trough. The alumni kids because they have money. Brooke Shields because she's Brooke Shields. Ted Kennedy's son gets into Harvard even though you and I might consider him disadvantaged. Nevertheless, here's my point. Here's my point. He's saying, his argument is that because, his argument is that because we have other forms of nepotism, other forms of nepotism or favoritism, why don't we have racial nepotism too? And my point is, I am arguing we want to move away from the nepotistical society. I'm not denying that there are forms of preference. I'm not denying that. But, I, but there is a special invidiousness, and the court recognizes this, to racial preferences. If I had a restaurant and I said, no one can eat in my restaurant who doesn't wear shoes, is that legal? That's legal. On the other hand, if I say, no one can eat in my restaurant who's black, that's illegal. That's illegal. And so my point is, race is not the same thing as other forms of preferences. There is, for good historical reasons that Professor Wu himself refers to, a special invidiousness attached to race. Thank you. Let's just... Um, I'd Please. like to actually return to this issue of pure merit. Um, Professor Tomasi had asked earlier uh, that I had mentioned earlier that pure merit, um, we do not necessarily know whether it's not based on other factors or not. I'm really asked whether or whether Mr. D'Souza thought, D'Souza that. thought that. And uh, you replied using this analogy of a race. And I have two questions concerning this race. Number one, the competitors who arrive at this race, do we see trends in the way in which they're prepared? Uh, for example, are there certain ethnic groups which are consistently uh, lacking uh, preparation and thus cannot compete properly. And number two, probably more importantly, what is the purpose of this race? A race is one thing, but a college education is a completely different thing. I'm sorry, can you, excuse me, can you just say why you think it's different? I, a college education is 
It is a right. And yet it is also, in, in the way in which we look at it today, it is a way to address previous environmental conditions of a person's lifestyle. What I mean to say is, if we believe that certain competitors are prepared uh, inequally, then when they come to this race, this race can actually, they can actually finish uh, first anyways. And that's what a college education can do for someone. Thank you. Please well, I think there's, there's a, essentially a fundamental flaw in your argument, which is that you're saying that the purpose of a college, I would have thought that the purpose of a college education is education, but apparently you think it is social justice. Uh, nevertheless, let's say it is social justice. You then go on to say that the purpose of a college education is to enable people who start out behind to finish first. So after rejecting the analogy of a race, you ironically return to it. And you embrace the idea of merit. You are simply saying that you want merit to now be, you want to prepare students who are not well enough prepared to win the race. And I agree with you, they should be prepared to win it. But you don't do that by destroying the fairness of the race. You don't do it by asking students to start on different lines. Only the guy who comes in first will think that's a fair race. Everybody else will feel it has been rigged because it has. Thank you very much.